Welcome, everyone. Uh, folks will be joining us for the next minute or two, but we'd like to get started in order to honor your time today. I'm Jane Field, Executive Director of the Maine Council of Churches. MCC is an ecumenical coalition of seven mainline Protestant denominations whose roots are in the Hebrew and Christian scripture. That includes Episcopal, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Quaker, Unitarian Universalist, United Church of Christ, and United Methodist. These members, along with our two associate member churches, Hope Gateway in Portland and Union Church in Biddeford Pool, represent 437 local churches all across the state who have about 55,000 members in their care. The council's mission is to inspire people within, through, and beyond the church to unite in building a culture of justice, compassion, and peace, where the full humanity and dignity of every person and the sacredness of all creation are affirmed and protected. One of the ways we fulfill that mission is by offering programs like this panel discussion of the film Torture in Our Name. Before introducing our panelists, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which the Maine Council of Churches offices stand and the land on which I live are part of the territory of the Abenaki and Okosisko tribes who lived in right relationship with this land for more than 12,000 years before European colonizers arrived. Their Wabanaki descendants live here still. May acknowledging those truths inspire us to take responsibility and become repairers of the breach. I invite you now to be in a moment of prayer with me. Creator God, as we gather, help us to listen compassionately, to speak humbly, and to act justly. Grant us vision to see the brokenness of the past, ears to hear one another's needs for healing in the present, and courage, patience, wisdom, and hope to work together for the future you dream. Amen. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists for today. Lori Swain and her son Zachary are advocates for incarcerated men and women. Lori began that work over a decade ago when she began financially supporting and being trained by Straight Ahead Ministries, now called the Transformation Project. Her youngest son, Zachary, who's joining us today, was incarcerated at the Maine Youth Center, the Cumberland County Jail, and the Maine State Prison from the time he was 18 until he turned 26. Lori was appalled at the inhumane treatment of those in the care of Maine's Department of Corrections, or DOC, as you'll hear them referred to today. She became an avid advocate for her son and for some of the other men he met through his incarceration. She's especially concerned about those who are treated badly by corrections officers, who are kept in solitary confinement and not allowed proper mental health, and dental services. She's worked with the legislature to attempt to end solitary confinement here in Maine and to find some form of accountability for the DOC administration so they will treat the men and women in their care humanely. Lori works as a tax accountant and spends her spare time helping children in the DHHS system as a therapeutic foster parent. Zachary is about to become a parent himself. Next on our panel is the Reverend Jill Saxby. She is the chairperson of the board of the National Religious Campaign Against Torture Action Fund. NRCAT is an official partner organization of MCC and Jill's involvement with them began when she was executive director here at the Maine Council of Churches from 2005 to 2013, during which time she served on the NRCAT board. During her tenure here at MCC, Jill organized programs and advocacy initiatives for NRCAT's main issue areas, which are solitary confinement and US-sponsored torture in the so-called War on Terror. Under her leadership, MCC hosted several tours of main prisons for clergy and lay leaders that gave them a chance to speak to incarcerated people and to stand inside a solitary confinement jail cell. These experiences gave many of them a deeper understanding of why prolonged solitary confinement meets the moral and legal definition of torture. Jill is an ordained Unitarian Universalist minister, 
a graduate of Bangor Theological Seminary, and an attorney who practiced elder law with her hus husband, Ed Saxby. She's lived in Maine for 35 years, and her favorite job these days is being grandmother to two amazing girls who are 7 and 14. Finally, Dr. Lonnie Graham joins our panel today. She received her MD from the Medical College of Pennsylvania, her MPH from Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. She did a residency in family practice and has received special training in psychiatry and addiction medicine. Her interest in criminal justice issues dates to early in her career when she took care of prisoners inside the walls of the Norfolk State Prison in Massachusetts for one year. She is the former director of the Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention, who is now retired from clinical work. Dr. Graham continues to work on public health as a member of the Public Health Committee of the Maine Medical Association. During the last legislative session, Dr. Graham worked as part of a team advocating for legislation to limit the hours that incarcerated people are left alone in Maine's prison and jail cells. So welcome all of you. In a moment, I'm going to ask each of you to share your reactions to the survivor stories that were featured in the film, Torture in Our Name, which is what were your reactions to some of the stories that survivors shared in the film? And this is a speed round, so you'll have 90 seconds um, to tell us, and I'll call on you one by one. Um, Dr. Graham, I'll start with you. A few quick reactions that you had to the survivor stories. Mute. Oh, we seem to be having some problems with there technology you go. today. Anyway, it was horrifying to hear in such detail about how people are treated with our very own tax dollars. It was crystal clear to me that this kind of mistreatment doesn't just happen occasionally in a really bad facility, but every day in every state across America as routine mismanagement. As one of the speakers in the movie said passionately, it is not right and it is not justice. But at the same time, it was inspiring to see what could be done when like-minded people work together, led by those who are directly impacted, like Zach and Lori. We can expect progress fueled by what we do together. Another very important thing that stuck out for me was that one of the speakers said, no matter how small your effort is, it matters. She said this several times. She is right. It is very easy to be overwhelmed by what needs to be done to make things in prisons and jails more humane. But that speaker was right. Doing something, anything to change the situation matters. It's so good that all of you are here listening and caring. Maybe you can tell your neighbor or your cousin or your brother what you have seen or heard. If you only do that, it matters. Excellent point. Thank you. Jill, what about you? I know you've worked with NRCAP for years, but watching this new film, a few reactions to those survivor stories? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I watched it again this morning, um, it really hit me that the title really says it perfectly, Torture in Our Name. I have absolutely no doubt that prolonged, unregulated, solitary confinement is torture, um, both morally and <clears throat> legally by the standards of international human rights law. Um, but the In Our Name, uh, in the film, Nafisa Goldsmith, who works with the New Jersey um, Prison Justice Watch, says, how are we participating in the system by turning a blind eye to what's going on. And thinking about it again this morning, I realized that for me, this has always been the biggest motivation for doing anti-torture advocacy, because once you know, you know. Yeah. As they said in law school, you can't unring the bell. Right. Once you know what's being done in your name, whether it's at a CIA black site on the other side of the world or at Guantanamo or right in our backyards in our own US prison system every hour of every day and night, the next question for me becomes really when you reach the end of your own life and you look back and you say, I lived through this time in history, what can I say I did about it? Mm. And I, I think that's the question we all need to ask ourselves once you've heard the bell ring. Right, right. Zach, I know it must have been complicated for you as a survivor. 
um, to hear people sharing uh, stories that must have resonated for you. Did you have any reactions you wanted to share with folks? Yeah, um, I think that uh, the stories were, were very like representative of what I went through personally. Um, it definitely sounds like they had a lot of similar experiences as me. Yeah. yeah. I can I can definitely relate. I bet you could. I I can't begin to imagine, but as I watched the film, I thought of you watching it and thinking, been there, done that <laughs> in a horrible, horrible way. And Lori, as Zachary's mother, as you listened to those stories in the film, what reactions came up for you? Um, I, I felt really sad, um, sad that, that people are going through this and really angry that it's allowed. Um, I think what Jill said is very true. Um, after seeing what happened to Zach, I can't sit back and not be fighting for every other man and woman who's mm -hmm. in um, mean prisons and jails and help them not to go through the same thing. And another thing that resonated with me is they said something about if these were animals that we would we would be outraged at this. And when Zach was in solitary confinement, I volunteer for the Animal Refuge League of Greater Portland. And I remember feeling I'd get the emails from them saying, we have a puppy or a dog or a cat who needs a shelter break. They're having a tough time being caged in. And I always felt like my son needs a shelter break. <laughs> and, you know, we'd go over and pick up the animals and take care of them. But our society is allowing our, our children and our fathers and our brothers and, and people who are loved by families. And we're allowing them to go into a system that's abusing them and torturing them and assaulting them. And, and we're sitting back and letting it happen. But we, we need to love these people as much as or more than we love these animals that we take such good care of. I agree, Lori. That that was a punch in the gut, that line in the movie. It really stopped me cold thinking she's right. She's right. They would storm the walls if people thought it was being done to animals. Yeah, horrifying. Well, I know that in addition to that moment, when I watched the film, I was confronted over and over again with how much I didn't know about the use of solitary confinement in our prisons and jails. And I'm guessing I'm not the only one on this call. So we're going to ask the folks in the audience to take a short quiz. You won't be graded, I promise. Um, and it's So Lori and Zach, um, I'd like to start with you in this uh, panel discussion um, and pose some questions to you. Um, and for those in the audience who weren't able to be with us on February 7th for our legislative workshop on a bill that is coming before the Maine State Legislature to uh, establish a study commission on the use of solitary in Maine, once that's posted to our YouTube channel, I would encourage you to watch it. Lori um, spoke as a part of that workshop, as did Jill. Um, but I've told Lori several times since then that I've been in meetings around the state since that night. And you are mentioned, Lori, over and over and over again as having touched people's hearts and moved people to action. So it is worth looking at that tape when we get it edited and up. But in that workshop, she um, shared her family's story. And uh, that includes Zach's experience from the time he was 18 to 26. So Zach and Lori, um, in the film, we heard about the challenges that incarcerated people and their family members face when it comes to sharing openly about the experiences you've had. So what steps can those of us uh, here today take to make sure that people find genuine compassion and care and concern when they interact with somebody who's had the experiences you've had. And 
if a group like a church or a community group invites someone, say from the Maine Prisoner Advocacy Coalition Speakers Bureau, to come and talk to their group, what advice would you have for how to make that space safe and welcoming, given how um, profoundly difficult and vulnerable it must feel to you to do that kind of sharing? What would you all have to say? Zach, would you like to answer that question? Um, sure. Um, I know for me personally, um, like when I've spoken, um, I've noticed that, uh, you know, um, you know, having a, you know, the, the person that maybe invited me to speak or maybe, um, people that are on the panel with me that are, um, you know, maybe like you know, not necessarily like helping me talk, but like giving me, you know, specific questions or just being supportive while I'm telling my story is, you know, helped me as person, a person with lived, lived experience greatly. Sorry if I'm stuttering a little bit. I had a tooth filled a couple hours ago, so my mouth is still numb. <laughs> oh, ouch. <laughs> but um, yeah, just, just having maybe somebody on the panel you know, for somebody with lived experience to, you know, maybe just, you know, help guide the discussion because it can be kind of overwhelming trying to talk about years of experience and in a short amount of time, you know, it's easy to get off track. Sure. That's I, really I think good it's advice. important for people to just um, care and, and mm -hmm. not to look at someone who's been in prison as a dangerous person or a bad person. Um, sometimes people are incarcerated when they shouldn't have been incarcerated. Sometimes people um, make a, a stupid mistake in their senior year of high school, one night out of their life, and they pay for that for seven years, and then they're a convicted felon. Mm. And um, sometimes people are bad when they go in and, and they realize what they've done and they change. And I think just giving people a lot of grace and a lot of love and compassion. And I think um, another thing that was really hard in the legislative hearings is that Randy Liberty and um, Ryan Thornell, um, the commissioner and deputy commissioner of the Department of Corrections came back after everyone spoke. And there were many people who spoke and told their stories and were very emotional and vulnerable. And they said they weren't true. And yeah. they tried to um, dismiss the harm that they've done to these people. And for me, that was really painful. Um, there was one person in particular that I was in a group with right afterwards. And he said that it just hurt him so badly that, that he opened up and, and shared his story and they tried to dismiss it and, and say that it didn't happen. And uh, Ryan Thornell in particular, um, spoke directly to Zach and said, well, he doesn't need to tell the truth. And <gasps> the fact of the matter is that these people coming out of prison, I'm hearing the same story from all yeah. of them. All these people can't be not telling the truth. So I think it's important to just believe what you're hearing and, and understand that these are hurt people who, who are trying to get help for others. Mm. Wise words from both of you. Um, and for folks on this call, at the end, we are going to give you some calls to action. And one of them is to invite someone from the Speakers Bureau to come to your church or your group. And I think Zach's suggestion about uh, having some questions laid out ahead, maybe doing a little run through and, and then being there in a supportive role to guide the conversation is wonderful advice. And Lori's uh, words about grace and um, compassion, um, and believing, believing when someone tells you. Um, it is gaslighting to have those authority figures walk up to the microphone afterwards and say what that person just said isn't true. Um, and we need to be there as advocates to stand with folks like Lori and Zach, who have the courage to tell the truth and let our legislators know that we believe them. Um, thank you both for sharing your wisdom and your experience. Um, 
though we won't have time in today's short hour for q and a, I will be dropping my email address in the chat so that if you have questions for Zach or Lori, um, I'm happy to pass those on to them and get answers back to you. Um, but thank you both, and thank you both again for being here. I'm going to turn to Jill for a moment now and um, ask you as the clergy in the house, madam, um, to say a little bit about what our faith traditions have to say about, that was the timer going off, about this issue and how we as people of faith should respond. Um, in the film, several people interviewed talked about the moral cost of allowing torture in solitary confinement to continue. So I'd also be interested in your thoughts about the um, how solid having solitary confinement done in our name impacts the morality or the moral fabric of our society. Mm -hmm. I suspect I'm not the only clergy in the house looking at the participants list. Um, so I wanted to talk a, a little bit about some of the faith resources that we can bring to this. Um, in the film, Reverend Dr. Charles Boyer says that for people of faith, and I think this is so true, our job is not to be the policy experts um, or advocacy or organizing experts, but to be the experts in the morality, the justice, the storytelling. Our job is to tell the story. So in the little bit of time I have, I'm going to do an extremely rapid review of the big story that we that we bring to uh, this and then focus for just a second on a story that's also referred to in the film. So here's the beginning of the big story. In the beginning, every person is made in the image of God. It's right there in Genesis, right in the beginning. It's still a pretty radical idea. Um, because it means that every person is of infinite worth to God. Every person has within them that of God. And therefore, we have to affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person. The moral state, this moral statement also just happens to be the basis of the whole system of international human rights and of our American system of justice. And it's clearly violated by solitary confinement. Okay, that was the beginning. Here's the middle of the story. Faith says that God is sovereign. No person is beyond the power of God's reach. Scripture is filled, as we know, with stories of God's inviting, identifying, saving, especially the oppressed, the weak, the exiled, and the unjustly incarcerated. Solitary confinement doesn't just offend secular, legal, and psychological concepts of good policy and good use of resources and good methods for rehabilitation. It offends the basic moral concept that, as one uh, rabbi colleague of mine at NRCAT puts it, humans may not curse what God has not cursed. It's an attempt to put human authority above God's ultimate authority by saying that this this human life is not worthy of redemption and restoration. Okay, that was the beginning in the middle. Now here's the end of the story. God's ultimate plan for humanity and creation is restoration. To be human is to be of God. To be of God is to be within beloved community, which is our destiny and which is being created even now. Community is where God acts. Community is where we all belong. It's what we're all invited to participate in. And that's where we find the hope. As Dr. Boyer says, we all know the end of the story. But solitary confinement is a form of exile. It puts the individual beyond the reach of community. It's literally dehumanizing. And therefore, it's an attempt to usurp God's power and plan over human life and creation. So now let me just turn to a specific story that was raised also by Dr. Boyer in the film. You can find it in Jeremiah 38, 38th chapter. I don't have time to read it to you. Go find yourself a Bible and check it out. Two things I'd like to invite you to notice when you read the story. First, the person who goes to the king to beg for Jeremiah's life when he's been thrown down into a cistern to starve to death and die of thirst alone in the dark. That person who goes to the king is an insider. He's a fairly high official in the king's court. He's a person with some privilege himself. He's somebody who has the power to approach the king directly and state the case. 
So what I take from this is if I'm a person of privilege in this unjust system of legalized torture, that's my job in the story, to approach the king, to approach those in power, to open their eyes to what's going on in their name and in our name, and to make sure, as Lori said, the truth gets told. And notice, this is the second thing I want you to notice in the Jeremiah story. The way that Jeremiah ultimately physically gets out of the pit, the way his life is saved, is not by the king alone or by the person who complained to the king alone, but by a group of people working together, using the resources of their community and working hard together. I see my time is almost up. I wanted to just address the cost, the, the question of moral costs. There are a lot of them I could list. Let's talk about two things that, and this goes way back in the movement against torture. We talk about this all the time. The cost to truth-telling. Truth-telling has taken a real beating in our culture in the last few years, especially. And when we don't tell the truth, it causes a cost to all of us. And desensitization. I see it throughout our culture and everything from kids' cartoons to solitary confinement to the fact that 35 men are still imprisoned at Guantanamo. We are desensitized to violence and to torture, and that is a deep moral cost. I'd just like to leave you with two sentences um, that I find helpful in doing this kind of faith-based advocacy. One is from scripture and one is secular. The one from scripture is in the Christian scriptures in Hebrews 13, verse 3. Remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are being tortured as though you yourselves were being tortured. And the last sentence is a secular from a secular source, but it helped me every time I got really nervous before I was about to testify at the legislature or meet with a, meet with a senator or a legislator who had a lot of power. And who am I to be, you know, who am I to be talking up about this? And the source, the, the source of this sentence is, uh, was my four-year-old daughter who once looked at me, hands on hips and glint in her eye and said, you are not the boss of me. So I remember that whenever I have to go up and try to speak to people in authority about something that I know is wrong, they are not the boss of us. We answer to a higher boss and our boss wants us to go tell the story. Well said, well said. Um, <laughs> Gee, Zach, I don't know. I have a 26 year old, just like a uh, year 26. And I don't know if you ever said that to your mom, but my daughter has said that to me too. You are not the boss of me. So I'll have to remember that one, Jill. That's great. And the Jeremiah 38 story is a powerful one. Those who are preachers in our midst today, I'd encourage you to consider preaching that text in conjunction with uh, the issue of solitary confinement in our state. So back to that quiz we tried to take at the beginning of our hour together. Dr. Graham, um, before we shift gears to help people think about how they can take action to end prolonged and unregulated solitary confinement, it's important that we have accurate information and accurate knowledge. So I'm going to share the results of the quiz we all took or tried to take a few minutes ago, and you can walk us through what the correct answers are. Okay, so Dr. Graham, have at it. All right, so the first question relates to the names that are used around the country and in Maine for solitary confinement. And it was one of the ways that we got tripped up in the last legislative session because we were using, we were describing things as solitary confinement, whereas uh, the DOC was saying things like restrictive housing and special management unit. So in any case, all of these are, are other names for solitary, except for the intensive mental health unit, uh, which is one of the better ways of managing, managing and helping people with uh, mental health problems that are incarcerated. Unfortunately, Zach uh, never made it to that unit, which is all too common. It's, it's not utilized as much as we would like to uh, see it utilized. Number two is true, and it's important to remember that. Looks like a smart group around here. Um, 
and uh, inflicting solitary confine confinement on those with mental and physical uh, disabilities is prohibited by international law. And everyone who answered that question said it was true and they were correct. Unfortunately, uh, that does not matter in our country. And people who do have uh, serious mental health disorders or other uh, medical problems can be placed in solitary confinement and are placed in solitary, solitary confinement. The Mandela Rules uh, revised statement, um, that is a definition uh, by the United Nations of solitary for 22 hours or more a day without meaningful human contact. And that too is true. And according to the United Nations, these conditions um, are routinely used by US correctional facilities. And our country is widely criticized internationally because of our use of this particular practice. And uh, should you decide to testify in the legislature, um, it is perfectly appropriate to say that severe and often irreparable psychological and physical consequences occur as a result of solitary confinement because that's been well documented. And uh, despite the fact that our Department of Corrections, which actually stands out in this country as one of the best in the nation because it has made strides, it still uses this practice. It still uses it. Um, and in, in 2022, Maine had more people die while housed in jail or prison than ever before. That's true. And many of those were housed in solitary confinement. And uh, this ninth question is a, is a clear statement about the uh, racist nature of uh, prisons and solitary uh, because uh, black men at age 32 are eight times more likely than white men. Um, incarceration and solitary confinement are uh, both um, aimed really at the poor and those who have are uh, marginalized. Um, and it is also true that prior to 1985, uh, solitary confinement was uh, infrequently used. And the reason it, that it became more frequently used was the war on drugs, which resulted in a lot of people with substance use disorders being incarcerated. And also around that time, uh, there was sort of a collapse uh, of the mental health support system, which is ongoing. And that too resulted in a lot of people who had mental health disorders ending up being incarcerated. So essentially our country, our state is incarcerating people with illnesses. Um, so what kinds of things uh, are excluded from being placed in prolonged isolation? Well, actually none of these are excluded. They're all um, reason, no, people can be put in solitary confinement for having a substance use disorder from uh, talking back to a guard for minor infringements. None of these things are excluded. Um, and in terms of nationally, how many people are in solitary confinement every day? I see this was one of the few questions that people had trouble with. It's shocking how many people uh, are in solitary across the nation. Anywhere from 30,000 to 80,000 people are in solitary every day. Um, and in terms of the number of people uh, who are in uh, prison, and I talked about this a little bit earlier, that are ill with uh, various issues, substance use problems, mental health, or even other serious medical conditions, it's up to 60%. So think how we could um, reduce solitary confinement by simply reducing the large numbers of people who are in prisons or jails who are ill. 
And um, the last question, uh, everybody got right who answered it, which is that zero to 10 uh, states have independent oversight boards. And in some ways, I think this is the most uh, significant of all of the questions, because until we know what's actually going on inside, uh, we cannot um, begin to really make strides. Because as we found out in the last legislative session, and as uh, Lori and others have spoken of so feelingly, we are told we're liars. And, you know, so we have in the future, I think it's very important to move forward with some independent oversight. And I'll just stop there. I think I'm out of time. <laughs> that was amazing, Dr. Graham. <laughs> I never thought we could get through all 14 questions in seven minutes and you did it. That was great. And with the crash and burn of our word cloud exercise, I think we may even end up with some time at the end for questions and answers, which I think would be a wonderful opportunity for folks. But first, um, we want to uh, pivot from describing the problem and confronting the problem to issuing a call to action, or more accurately, a call to actions, plural. Because though the temptation is there to give in to despair in the face of this kind of overwhelming suffering that's perpetrated by an entrenched system that by design is hidden, the courage and the resilience of survivors and their families like Zach and Lori, they compel the rest of us to keep hope alive and to act in solidarity with them to end the prolonged and unregulated isolation that's being used inside our prisons and jails. Because frankly, to do anything less amounts to complicity with a system that is perpetrating torture in our name, as the film's title suggests. So what can we do? Well, as people of faith, we can pray with and for all those people being held in solitary and for all those who have survived solitary and we can pray with and for their families. But that is not enough. Once we have prayed, we need to allow our prayers to move us to action. So one of the things you could consider doing is inviting a member of the Maine Prisoner Advocacy Coalition Speakers Bureau to come to your congregation or your community organization. And as each of these action steps are presented, you'll see a link drop into the chat that will help guide you toward uh, more information about how to take that step. Another thing you can do is host a screening of the film that we all watch, Torture in Our Name, and facilitate a discussion afterwards uh, using a discussion guide that is provided by NRCAT on their website. Again, there's a, a, a thing in the chat now, a link in the chat now that can guide you on how to do that. Um, it's just a 35 minute film, as you know, it would work very well in older youth groups and in adult education settings, maybe even in an untraditional worship setting. We invite you to take action by signing the NRCAT National Pledge, a moral call to end the torture of solitary confinement. The link on how to sign that online is appearing in the chat. Something that was said early on by Dr. Graham, speak to your friends, your family, your faith community about what you've learned here today. Speak to your state representative and your state senator about a bill that is going to come before our legislature in this session to create a commission that will investigate the use of solitary confinement, no matter what DOC tries to call it, in Maine's prisons and jails. We don't have an LD number for that legislation yet, but you can uh, contact us or you can go to the Maine Prisoner Advocacy Coalition website for updates as that bill moves through the process. And you've heard how important it would be to have voices of faith in that hearing room, backing up and standing with those who are brave enough to come forward and tell their story knowing that people in authority are going to try to say they're not telling the truth. You can write a letter to the editor of your paper. You can testify. You can testify in writing. You can testify in person. 
We have a guide on our website that holds your hand through every step of offering that kind of testimony. It sounds daunting. It's not as daunting as it sounds. And our guide and the link is in the chat, or you can just go to our website under public policy resources to find how exactly to do that. So I'm gonna invite all of our panelists back into the spotlight. And um, we do thankfully have time for some questions. And I see a former state legislator, Dick Farnsworth is with us and has his hand up and is ready to ask a question. So Dick, if you wanna come off mute and ask our panelists, that would be great. <clears throat> uh, first of all, I wanna make a comment. Uh, remember that uh, we are the boss of legislators. We're the ones who elect them, and we are the ones who have the power. So don't let people's you know get get dis disoriented in in this uh, power uh, arrangement because the people have the power. That's comment. Okay. Uh, do you have the name of the the uh, primary sponsor for the bill that's coming through? Uh, Lonnie, do you know if we've got that? Yes, it's it's Matt Moonen is going to be the primary. Matt, okay, Matt. Yep. Got a good, yeah. you've got a very good sponsor, let me tell you. Yeah, but, uh, good. And know Matt very well, obviously. <laughs> so, yeah, good guy. Uh, I will chat with him. Thank you. Thanks, Dick. And folks, remember, those words of wisdom are coming from someone who has served in our legislature. And by the way, he's also a United Methodist pastor, which not a lot of people know about my friend Dick. So um, Matt Moonen, Cheryl, M-O-O-N-E-N. He's the former executive director of Equality Maine mm -hmm. um, and a really good guy and very seasoned uh, expert about the workings of our yeah. legislature. Are there any others? I'm looking at the chat to be sure I don't miss any questions. If anybody put one in the chat or you can use the raise hand function if you'd like to ask any of our panelists a question. Um, we didn't think we'd have time for this and we do. Uh, Rashida, how can I join these calls and groups more frequently? Will there be future meetings? Oh, what a great question. Lonnie or Lori, uh, Zach, what would you like to say about MPAC meetings that happen around the state? Lori, you want to take that or you want me to? <laughs> I'd like you to, please. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, MPAC, Maine Prisoner Advocacy Coalition, has um, meetings every uh, month on a Saturday, and they're from 10 to 12. And it's usually the second Saturday in the month. And you can contact Joseph Jackson to be placed on that list of, uh, and I think Jan Collins could probably also place you on the list if you wanted to get those notifications. Um, we also have a little small group uh, that meets on Tuesday evenings from six to seven that is sort of geared towards strategizing on uh, our solitary confinement bill and our efforts there. Uh, so that's another option. Jan Collins is the host for that. Great. And Jill, what would you like to add? Yeah, I just wanted to put in another little plug for NRCAT, um, National Religious Campaign Against Torture, because um, there are advocates all over the country working on this um, issue. There's a lot of resources on their website. But one thing they do um, is they every quarter they have a, what's called a participating members call. It's now on Zoom. I just went on it last week. And you get to hear from people who are working on this issue in much larger states, much larger prison systems like California, New York, Virginia, um, but uh, also in other parts of the country and their ideas and ideas they have for bringing public attention to it. And it's sort of a mutually inspiring each other. So if you get involved, I mean, Main Council of Churches and MPAC are the main uh, sort of connections to NRCAP, but anybody can get involved. And at the very least, please do go on and sign your name on the moral call to end solitary confinement. Those names are used because there's also a whole federal advocacy uh, uh, thing going on right now to, uh, to ban solitary confinement in the federal prison system where there are 15 to 20,000 people in any given day in solitary. Those names help. 
they help when advocates in DC go in and talk to people in Congress. So great. That's a great tip. And yeah, I can't say enough about how great the NRCAT website is. It's got wonderful resources. Um, it's where you would go if you wanted to share the film with family or church or other community organizations. But um, yeah, those, those quarterly meetings, I think, would be a wonderful opportunity to connect because it's part of how we'll be effective advocates and faith-based advocates. Because remember, NRCAT is a faith-based group um, that you can support one another, learn from one another. Um, Cheryl Stratton is asking who the other United Methodist pastor is on the call. It's Dick Farnsworth, who uh, served for a short time as a Methodist pastor, but then became a social worker, ran nonprofits, and served in our state legislature. Um, he was my state representative, I was so proud to say, and a wonderful um, partner to Maine Council of Churches for many years. Uh, I see we have about six minutes left. Lonnie, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I might just mention someone asked me directly if uh, Maine has an independent oversight board, mm. and uh, we do not. And, and in reality, even the other states that do have independent oversight boards are very spotty and varying in their standards. And uh, if you want to look at some of the challenges, uh, take a look at what Connecticut tried to do. And they probably have the very best independent oversight board, and they've already had two um, unsatisfactory appointments to the board, which is part of the problem. So wow. you, you, there are no national standards for um, these independent boards. There are theoretically national standards for prisons and jails, uh, but the enforcement is very unclear. And um, so I think moving forward with transparency is going to be critical. Yeah, uh, we don't have transparency now. Yeah, I would just second right. that idea because, you know, this isn't the first time around on this. Um, 15 years ago, we were working on uh, trying to regulate prolonged solitary confinement. And as so often happens in the legislature, the bill we wanted didn't get passed, but a study commission was put together. It's not a bad thing to have a study commission it all depends on who gets to be on it and how transparent the results are and how quickly it happens. Um, if you have a turnover of legislators, it, it, it's like you're starting from scratch. Um, I did fail to mention earlier, one of the programs that NRCAT has used around the country and that you can use in your own community of faith or, or local community um, is a, a, a whole program you can see on their website about experiencing what it's like to be inside of a solitary confinement uh, yeah. cell and you can set up a box and there's a whole program that goes with it. I will say, I think one of the most life-changing things for me was the chance to tour the prison up in Thomaston and actually stand inside an actual solitary mm -hmm. cell um, because it's not just seeing it, it's smelling it, it's feeling it, it's mm -hmm. the whole feeling of being in there. I had to get out after about three minutes. Wow. So having having the chance to bring something that approximates that to your community um, can help. And don't forget to invite your local legislator if you do have a program. That's a great tip. If you do offer something, make sure they know about it. And um, Zach, I, I can only imagine you hearing someone say, I couldn't take it after three minutes <laughs> must uh, strike you as horrifically ironic um, mm -hmm. because you couldn't you couldn't leave after three minutes um, and and you were being tortured for years. And Lori, you were being tortured on the outside, knowing that was happening to him on the inside. And and again, being told by DOC it wasn't happening. Um, it's. Uh, it's shocking. And I wonder um, to Lori and Zach, maybe last word before we conclude today. Um, I was struck in the film that one of the women said, if she ever talks about this at her church, people will come up to her afterwards and quietly kind of whisper in her ear, my dad's been incarcerated or my, my child's incarcerated or I was incarcerated. How can we help people know it's safe to share that information and then 
how do we support them day to day? Uh, do you have any suggestions for how we do a better job of that in the days ahead? I think um, there, there's a program, a, a group called Rose's Room and here in Maine, and they meet in various towns and cities, but they also meet uh, once a month online, a statewide Zoom group. And it's to support um, people who have been incarcerated and their families. And it's primarily the families that are involved in it, but it's really a very, um, a, a very close knit group that becomes like family. Mm -hmm. and, it, and one thing that's hard is when you're going through it, you feel like nobody else can understand. And I know even my friends who cared about me and cared about Zach, they just couldn't understand what we were feeling. And so it was hard to share with them because the reaction I would get just was never, it, it just made me realize how people who aren't going through it don't understand people who are going through it. And um, Rose, who began Rose's Room, um, she, her son was, is in federal crypt prison and has been for many years. And she said that for years, she never told her family. They didn't know wow. that her son was in prison. They just thought he moved away oh and she God. was so ashamed and she didn't share it with anyone. And so I think there are still a lot of people who feel that same way. And we have pastors. Um, there's actually a pastor who does the group in Westbrook and her, she has a brother and a nephew who are incarcerated. And so um, they're, they're really, um, you know, everyday people that you walk by and you would never know that their family member is in prison and that they're going through these struggles. So there is support out there for, for people. Zach, you're the expert in this room. <laughs> um, we are honored by your presence today. And no matter whatever the credentials are of anybody else here today, you are the expert. So I'd like to give you the last word before I close us out. Yeah, um, I think, uh, you know, back to the question that you asked, um, like for me personally, you know, it kind of naturally comes up in certain conversations because I don't like to lie. So like somebody will ask a benign question and I'll usually answer like, oh, well, you know, I didn't do that or whatever the question is because I was in prison, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, or I just got out of prison recently, so... And it comes up and I've noticed, you know, through, you know, several conversations I've had with people, you know, more often than not, the people that I'm having conversations with where it does come up, either have a family member or have been in jail or prison themselves or mm -hmm. know somebody that's done a long time. And, you know, I don't get like, you know, a lot of negative feedback necessarily you know believe it or not you know like in my head I'm kind of thinking like oh great how's <laughs> how's this conversation gonna end but it's usually people are very curious I find you know and you know genu genuinely just don't know about it you know so I think better educating people on the topic what it's like in there a lot of it has to do with why people go in and you know like you know not everybody's you know, a psychopathic murderer just because they went to prison. <laughs> Good point. That's right. That's right. And, you know, Zach, your words ring true for me just in the planning session we had for this program. Everybody on the planning team, once we talked about the woman in the film who said people whisper to her, um, every one of us, including me, said, oh, yeah, I've, I've had a family member who's been incarcerated, that we need to break that stigma and give people permission to speak and the way we do that is to receive their story with grace and with compassion. I wanna thank you, Zach and Lori, Dr. Graham and Jill. Thank you for sharing your gifts of time and wisdom today. And I especially wanna thank NRCAT for the generous grant that they provided to make this and the workshop possible um, and to MPAC their steady partnership for us at the Maine Council of Churches means the world to us. And we're so grateful. 
Uh, behind the scenes today was Megan Akers. She managed your registration platform and she's been running tech today. I wanna thank her. And many thanks to every single person who attended today. We look forward to sharing our e-news with you from the Maine Council of Churches, but let us know if you wanna opt out of that. Um, and speaking of email, if you had questions that you didn't get answered today, um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to put my email address in the chat, so feel free to send it and I'll get it on to our panelists uh, and get an answer back for you. I'll end today with words that have ended worship for me and the church I grew up in for many years, and I think they are applicable today. Everyone here, I invite you to go now in peace and strive to learn the language of the heart. Know that the love of God goes with you today and every day that is to come. Thank you for being here. Goodbye, everybody.